Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever and whenever you may be listening. We're back with the Tech Policy Grind. I'm Rima Musa, and I'm a fellow with the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, the organization where the next generation of tech law and policy professionals convene to write, think, and talk about the web, technology, and disruptive innovation. This is the Tech Policy Grind, the Foundry's podcast where we chat about what's going on in the world of tech policy across a whole host of issues, including AI, cybersecurity, privacy, broadband, internet governance, content moderation, and so, so much more. It's a crazy world out there on the World Wide Web, the new wild, wild west, if you will, and we're here to guide you through it. This week, we're back with round two of our conversations at the State of the Net conference, and this time we're narrowing in. We're talking trust, safety, and privacy on digital platforms for kids and teens, and we're also talking Section 230, which some people call the law that started the internet. Fellow Foundry fellow Joe Catapano and I kick things off with a conversation with Natalie Campbell, Senior Director of North American Government and Regulatory Affairs at the Internet Society, following her panel on new legislative and regulatory approaches to child safety and privacy online. Then I get into the weeds on Section 230 with Matt Peralt, who's a professor of the practice at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hills School of Information and Library Science, and a consultant on tech policy issues, as well as Yael Eisenstadt, vice president of the Center for Technology and Society at the Anti-Defamation League, who's leading their effort to hold tech companies accountable for hate and extremism on their platforms. You might have heard of this Section 230 thing in the news recently. A few weeks ago, the Supreme Court of the United States heard oral arguments on two key cases for the law, and legislators have been focusing in on potential changes or amendments to the law as well. So kick back, tune in, and enjoy the episode.
So, the question I had, so I'm the father of a nine-year-old boy who's just uh, entered the world of online gaming and is starting to, you know, have accounts, and starting to have his information out there. So, um, what is the right balance between protecting the privacy of the child and that information and also parental control? That is a really tough question. I think it comes down to, I don't think there's one answer to it. Every parent has a different relationship with children. No child is the same. Every child has a different level of maturity, a different level of views of the world or whatever it may be, right? So I don't think that there's one answer. Next up, Matt Peral and Yael Eisenstadt on Section 230. Okay, thank you so much. We have Yael Eisenstadt and Matt Peral, so this is a real treat. Very excited to chat with you. You just came off a panel uh, before we had lunch, uh, all about the congressional side of Section 230. But just to start us off with a quick level set uh, before we put the tech policy experts to sleep, <laughs> uh, could we hear just what is Section 230, why is it important? So according to scholar Jeff Kossip, Section 230 are the 26 words that created the internet. It basically distinguishes between an information content provider or someone who provides content on a website and an interactive computer service, a host. Section 230 specifies that a host is not liable for content hosted by an information content provider. Um, in actions that treat that information content provider as a publisher. So the reason that this is important is it enables platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok to host user-generated content and not be liable for any illegal content in that content. It doesn't just protect large platforms, though. One of the panelists um, was on the public policy team at Reddit. It protects a range of websites and a range of different platforms from Reddit to the New York Times cooking uh, website, when the New York Times cooking website posts user comments. And, and just one thing to add to that, what's really interesting and complicating is it's trying to actually achieve more than one thing at the same time. Because Section 230 also protects platforms for how they moderate content. And so on the one hand, it's trying to encourage companies to actually engage in good faith content moderation. And I, that's one part of it. And then there's another part of it that, to everything Matt was just saying, is trying to say that they shouldn't be held liable for third-party speech. But sometimes those two things, they interact, but they can sometimes be at odds with each other as well. 
So let's dig into that a little bit more. So your panel was about congressional updates on Section 230. And so what's the current status of that? Are people trying to repeal it entirely or trying to amend it or trying to protect it and keep it as is? All of the above? All of the above, I right? I members of Congress, <laughs> I, yeah, some of all of the above, but there's sort of a different conversation, I think, that people are having at this event versus the conversation that's happening in Congress. In Congress, everybody hates Section 230. Um, they just disagree about the reasons why. But there's sort of a unanimous view that Section 230 should be reformed substantially, I think, among members of Congress, and I think I would include the administration in that as well. Yeah, and, and so what's interesting is, unfortunately, the conversations around Section 230 have really often broken down by partisan lines, but also people portray it as being such a partisan debate. They'll say Democrats want to take down more speech, Republicans want more speech to stay up. But the conversation we had today is way more nuanced than that. I don't think any of us on the stage today were saying it's kill Section 230, repeal Section 230. We all have different ideas for how, for me, I use the word update. I think there are ways where we should update Section 230 to meet the realities of today's internet. And I also do think that there could be some clarifications that Congress could enact in Section 230 because, for my opinion, the courts have really broadly interpreted Section 230 to cover a whole swath of actual company conduct and behavior as opposed to just third-party speech. So it's we had a much more nuanced conversation on that stage today. Indeed. So let's dig into that nuance a little bit of what potential solutions to clarify uh, Section 230 in the context of, okay, it's 2023. We have a variety of social media platforms that have become sort of a new digital public square for not just the US, but all over the world. So in that sense, what are some of the clarifications or um, amendments that could be made to Section 230 to help deal with the issues that get brought up where companies should be held liable uh, for, for content that's posted? I mean, from my perspective, and I'll just give one example, not everything that I care about, but from my perspective, one of the things that we could really benefit from is a clarification of where the lines are in terms of how far Section 230 should go. And what I mean by that is, I agree with the intent of Section 230 to protect a company to engage in good faith content moderation. I mean, good faith can be debated what that means, but where I think it could be updated is to really figure out how to differentiate between actual company behavior and conduct. I'll give one example, just the example I gave on the stage. You know, a lot of people know that there's been these cases about, with Facebook in particular, Meta now, that their own targeting tools, which they sell to advertisers, actually allows advertisers to discriminate against people based on race, gender, age, for housing ads, for job ads, which does violate civil rights law. But what's interesting is, because Facebook eventually settled some of those cases, people assume that means that the issue itself is resolved. It is not. There are still current cases going on today on this very same topic because Facebook is asserting that Section 230 is protecting them here. And I would argue your company actually designed a tool and is selling a tool to an advertiser that allows them to do this. That, to me, cannot possibly be equated with the same thing as the pipe through which third-party speech goes. So that's the type of clarification, just one example of where I think some updating could happen. This is this kind of conversation is exactly what I find to be so satisfying about events like this. I think Yael and I disagree about probably where we would want the line drawn, like what would be optimal for society in terms of what where we would actually draw that line. But we agree completely on the importance of figuring that out and having more clarity on what that looks like and coming to a point with the law where people understand it enough that that they get that, that line drawing exercise and understand as a result how 
how to use our technology tools really well. One of the things that I think that's interesting for me over the course of the last week is seeing how some of the smartest legal minds in our world, Supreme Court justices, lawyers for various different sides, um, analysts of this ecosystem, really have different views about some of the kind of underlying and core components of Section 230. For me, that's sort of for me, that's sort of encouraging in that when I was trying to learn Section 230, I think it was unbelievably complicated and hard for me. And when I started teaching it as a professor, it was really hard for me. I was really nervous teaching teaching the statute because it's it's really difficult to understand. And it seems to me like it's it's of such a level of critical import that we should have clarity, as Yale's suggesting, about where that line is. And so I'm most excited about various different mechanisms and policy tools that we might use to figure out that line. And maybe that means Yale gets a little bit more of what she wants on the substance. Maybe I get a little bit more of what I want on the substance. But either way, I think it is an important exercise for the relationship between tech platforms and their users to have a sense of where that line actually is. Can I have one point to that? Yeah. I mean, Matt was spot on. We might not agree on exactly where that line is, but I think we both agree that there will always be trade-offs. Right now, when people talk about Section 230, it's spoken about in a super absolutist way. If you touch 230, you're going to kill the entire internet, or if you leave 230 as is, the entire internet's going to be just dystopian and harm-ridden. And I don't look at it in that absolutist way. I don't think you do either. But what we don't talk enough about is, yes, there will always be trade-offs. And right now, the bar for doing anything with Section 230, as Matt mentioned on the panel earlier, is so high because there's so much, but if you do this, this thing is going to happen. I would love to have a conversation about what trade-off society is willing to accept, as opposed to it has to be perfect legislation before we can do anything. Right. So I want to dig in a little bit into how Congress versus the courts uh deals or is equipped to deal with these issues. Another panel that we heard from today was digging into how the Supreme Court is currently approaching two sort of, I think they're viewed as critical cases for Section 230. Uh, But what's your take on that? How do you think the courts versus Congress should slice uh, the issue? Um, So I wish we had a staffer from the Hill who could could be here to talk a little bit more about their perspective, um, particularly because I, at this point, feel in some ways most critical toward Congress, that if this is a law that needs updating in some form, and I think even its strongest proponents, maybe not its absolute strongest proponents, but many of people who are champions of core components of the law, and I would count myself as one of those champions, recognize that it was passed in 1996. the world looks very different than it did then, and there probably are some ways that you can tweak the statute, at least at the edges, to improve it. And Congress seems to be in a position where it is extremely challenging to actually govern. It's easy to do hearings that result in videos that you can tweet about how you slammed a tech executive or like press releases about how terrible some tech company is. That is messaging, that is politics, that's not governance. And my hope would be that we could actually get to a point in our politics where we have room to actually pass new laws and actually update existing laws that can be strengthened, and then to try to learn over a period of time how those updates, how those reforms perform in practice, and adjust the law as we go to improve it in light of what we've learned. I mean, it's interesting. There are a lot of people criticizing it. I do want the courts to figure 
about how you actually, I, I think the, there is some usefulness in recognizing that some of the court's interpretations, going back to the cases I was talking about, there are courts who have agreed that Section 230 should immunize Facebook from allowing targeting tools to violate civil rights laws. So it's, it's complicated, like everything. I would much rather see Congress do its job than leaving this in I am really con curious about the congressional perspective on this. I find often when you're seeing the sort of hostile tweets from members of Congress about how tech companies aren't regulated and are going to be too powerful, I just sort of find myself saying, it's you. You're the one who's in control, who can set the rules of the road here. If you have concerns and you have an idea for a regime that's more sensible, that can do a better job of balancing costs and benefits in this ecosystem, pass the law. The tech companies, I think actually many of them are at a point where they would be happy to follow a law that Congress is responsible for, that Congress owns um, and outlines in this world how to balance trade-offs in different ways. As Yale said, I mean, I think we really agree on this, that you know, there is no cost-free approach. And it's really not for companies to determine what costs society should bear um, relative to what benefits. That is a job, that is explicitly the job of Congress. And with Congress in action, but simultaneously pulling tech executives in week after week to berate them in hearings, that just seems to me like it's sort of the worst of all worlds. Mm. We, if, if we do need updates to the law, then we should have them and Congress should outline what they are. I'm not totally against Congress bringing in tech executives and making them answer questions on the record. I agree that when it becomes political theater, it's not really helpful. But I do think I would like to see, you know, I can look back at some of the things Mark Zuckerberg has said over the years and say, well, he said this on the record and now we know it's not true. I don't think it's a fruitless exercise, but I totally agree it shouldn't replace actually lawmaking. Um, right. If I were to read the tea leaves, I think we remain in a similar place that we are now. Listen, a lot of us are working on state legislation, on different various pieces of how we might uh, tackle some of these issues, like whether it's through certain kinds of transparency legislation, or all sorts of, Matt, Matt has all sorts of ideas on as well for other ways to tackle some of these issues. I don't see Congress making a real dent in this debate. I don't know where the Supreme Court's going to land, but based on what we've heard so far, it seems like they're going to kick it back to Congress. So, unfortunately, I think we're going to be in the same place for a little while. Fortunately, I think there are enough people out there trying to think of other innovative solutions and where else lawmaking could actually address some of the harms that we are concerned about. Uh, so that was a long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with all of that, including um, a sort of shift in governance power, not necessarily bully pulpit power, but governance power from the federal government to the states. Um, Yale and her organization have been responsible for passing legislation in California that I think is the kind of thing that will enable us to better understand how various different policy regimes actually work in practice. Um, there are very controversial laws in Florida and Texas that the Supreme Court is likely to hear in the next term. Um, there's also laws on, on harmful content in New York that I think will give us opportunities to understand what governance in this area looks like. I, I like the activity at the state level because I think it's good that there's governance activity, but I do think this is sort of a quintessential area where the federal government really should decide. It doesn't really make sense to have one set of rules for the internet in New York and another set in Texas. Right. A patchwork as we see in the privacy field. Well, before we wrap up, this is a podcast hosted by uh, young professionals in the tech policy sphere. So, Yael, you mentioned that there are folks who are at the front lines working on innovative solutions. If anyone is listening who wants to be one of those folks on the front lines, how do you recommend that folks get involved or sort of start to embark on a career in this field? That's a great question. I think in part what's exciting now is there's so many different ways you can do that. And, and here's what I mean. I, you hear so many people complaining that Congress doesn't understand technology enough to regulate technology, which I, I laugh at because apparently in 1996 we thought they did. But um, I, I'm a public servant at heart. I was a public servant for the vast majority of my career. So I always actually try to encourage people to consider public service. Um, you know, you might laugh when you hear a senator ask a question that you think isn't brilliant. The staffers that staff those senators 
do an incredible amount of work, super interesting, get to actually help write laws. I will always push people to consider public service, but there's a whole vast array of ways you can get involved in academia. You could work for civil society like an organization at ADL if there's a specific slice of it you're concerned about. I just am thrilled that more and more people recognize that this is an area that needs as many smart minds as possible on it. I agree completely on Yale's point about um, sometimes people not giving enough weight to the sophistication of members of Congress and their staff. There were a series of hearings on antitrust issues over a long period of time in the House, and I think if you look at the development of those questions from some of the initial hearings to some of the later hearings, you'll see really a tremendous um, amount of learning and sophistication on behalf of members um, over the period of time of conducting that investigation that I think really deserves applause. Um, on the question of uh, careers in the field, um, I, our takeaways from our experience at Facebook, where we both worked for a period of time, I think are somewhat different. But one thing that's interesting, I think, in both of our perspectives is that we sat for a period of time in the position of being within a company that had to make hard decisions and then bear the costs of poor decisions or the benefits of good decisions. Um, being in that situation where you are a decision maker and, um, and you have to confront those trade-offs head on. I think is really important, and you can draw different conclusions from that. Like I, um, I mean, Yale. I think as she's written about, and I think most people know. You know, I find her experience to be very poignant in understanding from the position of being in the room with decision makers. What decisions did the company make that um, that, in her view, were like really deeply problematic? And I had different experiences in my some of the components of my Facebook experience, but I still feel like a lot of my work is driven by sitting in that chair and being confronted with a lot of horrible decisions, like outcomes that would, any decision you make would frustrate groups, um, could potentially harm people. And, you know, I tried really hard to wrestle with those trade-offs and be sensitive to sensitive to those harms and sensitive to those costs. And I think when you are only in the position as a critiquer of decisions that other people make, um, you're missing some, a really important component. And if early in your career you can get that exposure to those to, to those positions that require you to assess those trade-offs, I think that's really valuable. I 100% agree with that. I, I think, sure, being in a role where you're critiquing is important, but when you actually are able to go inside, whether it's in government, whether it's in a company, and learn, I don't regret it at all, despite having been pretty public about how much I didn't love my experience at Facebook, certainly learned a lot. And now when I put forth my ideas, I always think about well, what is actually achievable, what is doable, what can the company actually do. So that is a hugely valuable experience to have as well. Absolutely. Well, I think especially early in career, so much of your experience is about learning, taking things in, building out the toolbox with different tools. So thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you. All right, folks, that is it. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Tech Policy Grind. Let us know what you think of the season so far and our State of the Net series. Get in touch with us at Foundry Podcasts, with an S, at ilpfoundry.us, and leave us a review on whichever platform you may be tuning in on. I'm Rima Musa, the host, producer, and editor of the show, and this podcast wouldn't be possible without the help of our team at the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, particularly Loma Muhammad, our social coordinator, Allison McReynolds, our accessibility coordinator, and Tim Lorden at the Internet Education Foundation.